All right, so uh, going to talk today a lot about attributes. Um, the name of the talk is Bulletproofing Your Attributes. Why could possibly go exception? Has anybody ever seen that exception before? <laughs> of course you have. All right. So about me, uh, I'm a web architect at OmniTI.com. Uh, we do web ops, web development, performance. Are we hiring? <laughs> of course we're hiring. All right. Uh, incidentally, anybody out there who has Solaris experience and wishes they had a home, you got a home. All right. Uh, so I'm a former web dev lead. Did a lot of Mod Perl in the day. Did a lot of Rails, some Drupal. Today, though, I do chef stuff. Uh, sometimes I'm called a DevOps consultant. If you believe that is an animal that exists, you can believe in me if you want. Um, mostly that means I talk to people about Chef, how they work with Chef, their workflow, their pain points, what different pain points they could have if they chose a different workflow. I'm also the author of various bits of tooling and glue, especially around uh, Vagrant, uh, RSpec, Berkshelf, lots of other stuff like that. Um, so I write a lot of glue for that. And there's my Twitter and my GitHubs. Yay. All right, so we're going to do it in three parts today. First part is going to be background on attributes and their pluses and minuses. Now about this section, how many of you people are new to Chef? Seriously, raise your hand if you're new to Chef. Okay? Cool. So how many of you people don't need to hear a talk about what attributes are and what sucks and what's great about them? Okay, that's about a split. All right, All right. I was hoping it was going to be about even on that, so I'll go medium pace through this then. All right, All right so what's an attribute? An attribute is a, spe is a specific detail about a node, according to the chef docs. Um, for, your, for you, though, it is a giant ball of information that you get back during your run um, that you can access in a nice way. Um, sometimes they're described as being the knobs of cookbooks. So like a, someone who wrote the Apache cookbook or something like that will expose a whole bunch of attributes that allow you to customize it to your specific needs. You can change the ports. You can change what modules are installed, that kind of thing. Um, so attributes have a life during convergence, in other words, during the actual execution of the Chef client or Chef Solo, and that's mainly what I'll be focusing on today. But at the end of every run, if, they, if there is a Chef server involved, some of, the no, some of the node's attributes also get saved back to the server. Mostly I won't talk about that much, but those are the attributes that are used when you are doing searches and that sort of thing. All right, so what's great about them? They're so awesome, right? Um, you can set them in roles, environments, nodes, uh, cookbook attributes, recipes. If you're new to Chef, all of these words are known to be English but have no actual meaning. If you've used Chef before, you're, you just want me to move on. <laughs> so somewhere in between. Anyway, the point is there's a lot of different ways to set them. Um, you can also set them at various levels of precedence, meaning that if there's a collision, there is a way of deciding who wins. And <coughs> There's also a rich, deep structure. You can, what you're doing is basically, it's sort of like JavaScript literals of, of array, uh, arrays and hashes and strings and all that sort of thing. So it can be very, very deep. And if you have two things that resolve to the same attribute path from two different sources, they get merged together in an elegant way. Maybe elegant is too strong of a word, in a way. Sophisticated way. I'll say sophisticated. And then the best part of all this complexity and flexibility is that it's mostly hidden from you. As a user of a cookbook, or as someone who's authoring a recipe, you mostly see it as just being things that you access using brackets on the node. So you say node, bracket, bracket, thing, no, bracket, bracket, thing, etc. You don't have to care about all the rest of this stuff. You never have to care about where your attributes come from, right? That's not a problem you have. All right. So what's awful about attributes? Same slide with different things. The bad thing about having so many things, ways of setting them, is that there's so many ways to set them. There's no obvious way. And until a few months ago, ops code slash chef was very reticent about dictating a particular way of doing things. There, that's changing a bit. We're getting into more of a best practices phase. Uh, and I think that's good. But the reality of this is, is that wherever you are, there's going to be local practices. There'll be local best practices. And if you're not a very process-oriented place, there's going to be a mixture of practices. And you get to pick which ones you use that day. Um, as for setting them at various levels of precedence, there are 15 levels of precedence as of today. That's terrible. And they interact in really non-intuitive ways. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about precedence later on. But precedence becomes a big headache for most people. The rich, deep structure, uh, also, it's sophisticated, it's highly flexible, and it's a big effing headache. Um, when, it, when you're merging hashes, mostly that works as expected. When you're merging arrays, 
oh my God, things break in really, really weird ways. Um, after the talk, I'm hoping to have a little bit of office hours somewhere, someplace, and I can like rant about this so much about arrays. Anyway, um, but anyway, as for accessing all the values in one simple way, that also means that it's really hard to debug collisions because by the time you get that node, that node thing that you're talking to, all the merging has already happened. All of that, where did it come from data is gone. We'll explore that later. My need there was that I needed some way of tracing that and I made a tool for that and that's part three, tracing. So, uh, really quick, uh, if you've used Chef at all, you're, you may have heard about data bags. If you haven't used it, you may have heard it about it as well. Who knows? Um, shaped a lot like attributes. You can do similar things. Um, at, uh, data, data bag items are not tied to any specific node. Some people like to use them for global data. Some people think that there is a kind of data that is more global than others. Other workflows use things like environment cookbooks to say that's as global as data gets. Other people say global means it should be in a application cookbook. Lots of different ways of doing this. Point is, data bag, data bag items are definitely global in that sense. They are definitely not tied to a node. They can be encrypted, but it's not great. There's problems with it in that you shift to having a key distribution problem. There's also some awkwardness. If you've ever used Chef, uh, Chef Vault, uh, look into it. If you have problems about in encryption and wish it worked differently, you, there are other options as well. Um, I think, though, the biggest complaint I have about data bags, and I don't mean to be against data bags necessarily. There are definitely workflows that it's great. Um, but uh, the thing that makes it most awkward for me as a cookbook author and um, cookbook maintainer is that the access method for data bag um, items is irregular. You have to call a method, you have to um, call a different method based on whether it's encrypted or not, and you have to provide a key, and you have to know which key to provide. Um, that's all very different than how you get to attributes. Attributes, you just say node bracket, 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 bracket. So you have to write your, your cookbooks differently if you're using data bags versus attributes, and you have to write a lot more codey, codey, codey code if you're using data bags. A lot of people end up just pulling out a data bag and putting it in a hash and then pretending it's a node, or pretending it's a, a, a node attribute. All right. Cookbooks that try to give you both ways do exist, but there aren't that many, and they're really complicated. So anyway, so that's data bags. So next, I would like to talk about who understands precedence. I'm not sure anyone does. Hey, all right. <laughs> cool. Um, alternate joke here is that the guy who maintains the precedence code probably understands it. I don't. I don't understand it in the sense that I have to go back and read it every time. Hi. Mike just fell off. All right. There we go. Okay. So um, regarding precedence, at first the advice was to use precedence liberally. Uh, you know, hey, if you, need, if you need to override something, go override it, man. More power to you. Later on, uh, the advice sort of evolved a bit into uh, use it only when you have to, and now today most people, most people think of, of precedence as being basically you should use default unless someone smarter than you tells you otherwise. And if you're the smarter guy, be really careful what you tell people. Um, yeah, I'll move on past that. All right, so the biggest thing, though, is there ain't no bracket bracket when she's nil. Um, Shit. Ruby hashes don't auto-vivify. I come from a Perl background, so I'm used to things auto-vivifying. Yeah. <laughs> so um, auto-vivifying means if you set a, a hash key that's like three levels deep and the upper two levels don't exist, they will magically pop into existence. And that is great. Make, I, I'm sure there is. It, they don't by default, though. Right. Yeah. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure there is one. Um, so Chef modified a few things uh, to give you that effect, which is wonderful. Um, great. But the problem is there is a huge asymmetry here in the access in that when you set things, you get that feature. When you read things, you don't. Uh, in Perl, for example, if you read something that doesn't exist three levels down, you get undef, which would be nil in Ruby. Um, so it's, you get auto-vivification even on read. Um, in Ruby, you don't. Uh, here you get a a no method bracket bracket for nil nil class, which if you're an ops guy and hey man, your magical configuration management tool keeps erroring out with this monstrous barf thing, that is such an awful error message. So I want some way of saying this attribute must not be nil and I want to provide a different error message if it is nil. And that's one of the big motivators for writing attribute validator. 
Um, if you don't have a, an attribute validator, you end up with stuff like at the bottom here, these very long, um, you know, if this exists, if that exists. The more levels you have to go down, the more clauses you have to add. Alternately, some people will do a begin, rescue, end clause, which is also, you know, not great. So, and then, of course, all of the, both of those approaches take effort, and then effort doesn't happen. <laughs> and so, anyway, then you get the exception. So, moving on. Part two of three, in which validation is sought. Introducing attribute validator. I wanted something that would help me with some of these problems. And this was sort of discussed slash presented slash discussed at the community summit. Anybody here from, was anybody here at that? Awesome, awesome. Uh, so yeah, um, it's a little bit more polished now. It's been in production use since then, and it's turned out really well. Um, the goals were to make it obvious when things are wrong, uh, to allow a cookbook that uses those attributes to define exactly what wrong means, and also to make it easy to integrate into testing, because if you're validating things, it means you're checking things, which is sort of a testy kind of thing. You want it to be easy to fit into your test flow. And then also, validation means breaking things. And I want to be able to turn off the breaking when I have to. When I have to get something pushed out, and it's some attribute I don't actually care about right now, it'd be nice to be able to turn it off. And that's a, a big driving thing from ops engineers as well, that you know we need to be able to get our job done sometimes when your little finagly thing is breaking. So, all right, here's an example. Truth and nuclear weapons. All right, so suppose we have a cookbook that defines the state of the world regarding nuclear weapons. And our current state, by default, is that nuclear weapons are enabled. All right, and then we have a role, the Plowshares Fund, which is attempting to disable nuclear weapons. We would like to remove nuclear weapons. All right, great. All right. So we are free, then, if we have this role, to run this against a recipe that pushes the big red button and sets off the, all the nukes because we've got the plowshares fund and they've all been disabled. So should be safe, right? At this point in the presentation, I will alt-tab. Totally going to work, guys. Not the problem. Oh, wait, I'm already in the right buffer. Wheels have already come off. All right. This will be about a 20, 30 second converge here. Uh, so just running Vagrant under Emacs. So that's what you do. That's what you do, man. Right, right? <laughs> All right. So uh, da, da, da. we expect the world not to blow up, but it blew up. Kerblooey. All the nuclear weapons went off and we're all dead or glowing or both. So that, that's no fun. What happened? All right. You know, we're setting enabled to be quote, false quote. Is that cool, man? Wait, wait a minute. Ru Ruby doesn't think quote, false quote. That, no way, right? That's got to be, oh, God damn it. Yeah. So this is, this is the pain here, man. Here are four common dynamic languages. Uh, the first two we kind of expect ops users to have some familiarity with, and people may have familiarity with the other two, too. But as you can see, there's no consistency between them. The circled one is our problem here. And I'm just going to go ahead and say this loudly. The only two false things in Ruby are the literal false and nil. Everything else is true. An empty array, an empty string, zero. It's all true, man. So, sorry. That means, quote, false, quote, is true, and the world just ended. All right. All right. So. There's no way JSON will actually. We'll get to that. It's cool, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the thing, though, is, is that the cookbook is expecting some arbitrarily true value here. And what you're saying is that if JSON couldn't express a true, true, or a false value like that, then maybe the cookbook should be behaving differently and like looking for some value or something. But how do we express that the cookbook should be looking for some value and only certain values are permitted? Attribute validation. Let's do it. All right. So add a new attribute to the cook, to the nukes cookbook, setting up a validation rule. So I'm adding a validation rule and it is itself an attribute. All right, so attribute validator is the name of the cookbook. I've namespaced my attributes under there like a good little boy. Under that is rules. That's where all the rules live. The next bit is nukes yes or no, and that is a string that is used as a 
message and any sort of errors that occur from trying to run this validation. Um, then we set two things on it, uh, only one of which is required. Uh, path is required. Path is the path to the attribute that we're examining. I use slashes, sort of a metaphor against the file system, which hopefully we're familiar with. Um, we added, uh, this isn't just dumb though, you can also use some globbing. Uh, it can do a star for one level or arbitrary string um, without slashes, or you can use star star for arbitrary string with slashes. Hopefully one day I will add curly brackets and other wacky globby stuff too, but patch is welcome. So anyway, uh, the other thing there is type. I'm saying this thing should be of type Boolean. I'll, I'll, we'll talk more about the other types later on, but for now we're just saying type Boolean. So. And then the other, the other bit here to actually cause the validation to run is add a recipe to the run list. You'll see that I'm saying attribute validator compile time check. Uh, attribute validator does not provide a default recipe. It, you must use it explicitly, and you get your choice of compile time or convergence time. Compile time will try to run as the very, 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 very first resource executed. Obviously, if you're running something that cheats and runs a resource at compile time, you may fool it. So don't. <laughs> or put this first, and then it will try to win. So anyway, um, the goal here is for it to, I'll, I'll, I'll run the, the demo, and we'll talk about that real quick. I'm going to wait alt tab so many times. There we go. Hans Blix is called in to inspect the nukes. Again, about 20, 30 seconds here. So this build has that, that uh, validation rule in it. Uh, it also has the validation, the compile time validation, as well as convergence time uh, in there as well. Here we go. All right. Different result. Different result. Um, can I highlight? Can I have a mouse? Yes. All right. So look at that. The value is false, which does not appear to be the right type, I expected boolean. So that is better than nil-nil class, and it's also better than nuking the world by just silently working. <laughs> That's bad in this case. So, um, Also, though, importantly, because it's compile time, this happened before any resource converged. So nobody touched the nukes, because we don't know whether we have nukes or not, is what it basically said. I can't tell, so I'm not going to let you set them off. So you want your nukes to be safe. All right. All right. Do, 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 do. Uh, fixing truthiness. Yes, it turns out JavaScript does have a literal false, and you can just say false. That works. Kind of lucky, though. That's like one of the few types you can use in, Java, in JSON. There's not a lot. So anyway, uh, I do have a demo of it running and, and not blowing up, but it's not that interesting. It just works. So anyway. So talking a bit more about the validator itself and why it's shaped the way it is, it comes as a two-part thing. There's a gem and a companion cookbook. Uh, I split it up that way so that it would be easy to use the gem in your test flow. Um, it could have been implemented as a library cookbook, um, which would be cool, but then if you wanted to use it outside of a convergence run, you'd have to like download the cookbook and extract it. Anyway, so it's a gem. Um, the cookbook's on the community site. The gem is on Ruby gems. Uh, da, 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 da. The cookbook will handle installing the gem if you call either compile time or converge time install. And the validation is applied by a run list. That kind of ended up small. Sorry, this is a last minute slide. Um, where it fits in your workflow. So I wanted to make sure I got this idea across real clear, that you're not going through and adding ad validation rules to like the end user's work cookbook. The idea is that you're implementing a reusable cookbook, like the Apache cookbook or some cookbook being reused across your organization. And you can't predict who's using it. You can't, you're not the same person setting the values in it. So you want to ensure that the right things get set. So that's where you make the validation rules. The validation rules go in right next to the attributes you're defining. And then you adjust the attributes for your use case however your workflow dictates. Some people use roles. That's cool. Set your attributes in the roles. That's fine. When the convergence actually happens, assuming you include the validator, it will see what value you set and then run the rules which the cookbook defined against the actual value that it resolved to. And so then that allows it to, your, your roles are allowed to vary or your, your builds are allowed to vary while the, the knowledge of what is a permitted value stays the same. So. But you can do it using environments. You can do it using environment cookbooks or wrapper cookbooks or unicorns, whatever the hell you do. Nobody does the same thing. It's all right. Um, so anyway, uh, but during, during the testing run, how can, you run, how can you test this? 
Um, I use it personally in at least two different ways. Uh, during a vagrant test run, I'll just in throw in attribute validator into the run list and off we go. Alternatively, I also have a build in which, or I also have a, um, a rake task that takes a Burks file, unpacks it, looks at all the different cookbooks used, puts them back together in a combinatorial list of all, every possible run list, and then runs chef spec against that run list. Chef spec, incidentally, if you're unfamiliar with it, just does a convergence in memory. It doesn't actually run any, anything anywhere. So the end result of that is a node that's been built up with all of its attributes. And then at that point, I can run the validator code from the gem. So that's really fast. And that works really well with the CI engine. So. OK, so the, the different things you can do with the validator. Uh, we've already seen type. You'll notice these are not Ruby classes. It, it would, that would have been an option. But attributes get passed around from JSON to Ruby and back again a lot of times, and into Postgres as well. So just using some generic things was a little bit more practical. Regex is pretty straightforward. Enums, an array of things required and present are interesting. Um, all of these will accept, will tolerate nil. So if you set nil, uh, if you set a value to be nil and don't say anything and, and you don't mention required, it will pass validation. If you want to enforce something not being nil, you need to say required true. Required says that attribute path must exist. Whatever path you gave me must result in non-zero attributes. And the value of all of those attributes must be non-nil is what required says. And I say, of all the things the path resolves to, because you can have globs in your path. So it could be more than one path. Uh, present says kind of the opposite. Present is, um, if you set it to true, it does absolutely nothing. Um, if you set it to false, it asserts that that thing must not exist. So that's excellent for deprecation. Min children, max children, those work with uh, hashes and arrays and should be straightforward. Uh, two smarter validations. The looks like. Um, so these are all canned things. You can say it looks like a host name or it looks like a URL. Um, these all either apply, you know, pain in the butt to remember regexes or else, they, uh, or else they call out to things like the URI library or that sort of thing to see if it can build that. Proc, though, is, is a Swiss Army knife. Proc lets you write a proc. Anything you want. You can. So using these two things together, you could have something that says, um, you could have something that says this attribute should be a URL, and then you can implement a proc that says, if I hit that URL, I should get a 200 back. So if you wanted to do that, you could. If you want to have that happen every time your node converges, you can do that. Your choice, man. I don't know. So uh, quick example of building up a little bit more complicated thing, showing them in, uh, working together. There's a requirement to have an S a pool of SFTP URLs. I don't know why I'd want that. Maybe you do. I've seen it, all kinds of reporting things. All right, fine. So we start off with the default of an empty array. Um, it's got to be an array, type array. Required, true, it must exist. I say type array here because somebody might have overridden this later. Sure, I provide a default that's an array, but some jerk may come along later and just put a string there, put their one URL there. That could happen. Or they put a long string separated with commas. Yeah, all right. That happens. So <laughs> anyway, if you want an array, use an array, guys. So uh, required's true, min children one, have to have at least one. So that means out of the box, this will fail validation because you're not providing at least one child. So get on that, reproduce. <laughs> um, comedy. So all right, uh, the next thing here, I'm, uh, at this point, we've, we've validated the array itself. But next, we need to validate the elements of the array. So you notice that the path here changes. The path has an asterisk at the end. So it says, all the children of this must match these. And it says it must look like a URL, and it also must match this regex. It must start with the beginning sftp colon slash slash. So as you can see, there's a lot of potential there. You can combine a lot of stuff. You can put a proc in there, all kinds of things. Hey, you could use proc and connect sftp. All right, so how to turn down the awesomeness. Uh, anytime you add something that could blow up, you want to be able to turn it off. By default, out of the box, its job will be to halt the convergence, to throw an exception and stop. Um, so if you don't want that to, ha to happen, there's a couple different things you can do. If it's one rule that's giving you a problem, you can override that rule. You can track it down wherever it was defined and change enabled, or you can add enabled equals false. You knocked out one rule. Good for you. Um, you can also turn the fatalities into warnings. 
Um, so it'll just emit log messages. Warning, obviously, if your nodes are out there in the world and you don't have anything sending your logs back to you, you will never know. <laughs> so, uh, or you can just simply remove the validation from the run list. You know, you don't, if your validation is causing you a headache, don't do it, um, says the guy who wrote validation. Anyway. <laughs> um, some consequences of the rules being attributes. Um, so this was a lot of, there was a lot of discussion about this at the community summit about where the rules should be defined and how they should be defined. And uh, the eventual decision was to put them as attributes themselves. Um, to me, that's great because it keeps them near the thing that they are validating and proximity promotes maintenance. So if somebody goes in and changes how a, an attribute is supposed to work, they'll ch hopefully change that too. Fingers crossed. Uh, it is opt-in. If you've got a cookbook that defines 90 attributes and two of them are problematic, define two sets of rules. You don't have to define 90. So that's good. I've had some people say, oh my god, I've got to define all these things. I'm like, no, you don't. Do what, do what is important to you. Add value where it, need, where it is needed. Um, I think it's great, though, attributes, uh, because they get versioned right alongside the cookbook. So that enables a deprecation. Uh, you can have 0, 090 0 do one thing, and then 1.0 do something else. And 1.0 can add that present false to say, you're not allowed to use this old attribute anymore. Um, and that means anybody who blindly upgraded their cookbook across a major version and didn't test will find out the first time they converge using the validator. But that that indicates the existence of someone who did not test and yet uses, by choice, a validation cookbook. <laughs> All right. <laughs> they probably don't exist. Um, finally, the last consequence, uh, the rules themselves can be tweaked downstream. So if you have a cookbook that's defining a rule that's too tight or too loose and it's wrong, you can adjust it for better or for worse. Um, also, you can knock out individual things, perhaps for testing, like um, that example of having a URL uh, that you would then use a proc to go out and hit. Maybe you're in a test environment where that doesn't actually exist. Um, you could knock out the proc check, but keep the URL check. By just any of those checks that you define in the, in the rule hash, if you set their value to be nil, that disappears. So you could set proc nil. Gone. Or override it to something else. All right, so that's validation. Good times. Um, validation is usable. You can download it, use it today. Send me feedback. Implement changes, add them. Yeah, what's up? Um, you can implement it in your recipe if you want. Um, there, the gem exposes um, a, uh, you can just say require chef attribute validator, and then it's just a simple call to chef attribute Chef colon colon, attribute colon colon, validator colon colon, validate all node. And then poof, you just validated everything and it'll, it'll return an array of, of violations that it found. And then you can do something like say, if that array is non empty, halt the convergence. And if you do that, congratulations, you have implemented <laughs> the compile time check. <laughs> that is exactly what it does. Um, the actual attribute validator cookbook is extremely small. All it does is install the gem and do basically what I described. The convergence time check does the same thing except in a Ruby block. So. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You said at the beginning that you want to put it at the very beginning of your run list. Yeah, I would suggest that. Recipe, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I agree. And what effect does that have? Ooh. Well, uh, in the nuclear weapons thing, uh, for example, you may have some, uh, well, see, if you implement it outside of a resource, if you make that call outside of a resource, it will still run at compile time. So any changes that happen at compile time in recipes that came ahead of it will still get run. But that's a pretty rare thing to do. Things like, you know, build essential and a few other things will do that trick to trigger a compile time convergence of a of a resource. Um, but so for the most part, if you do if you do it outside of a resource, it won't have any effect depending on what's What's ahead of it? I mean, it won't, it won't have any effect, meaning it, no other resources would have converged. It depends on what's ahead of it, really. So, yeah. I mean, the general case is you would want this to be at the top of your run list. Yeah, but I think if you, if you have a replacement for, let's say, the, the entire chef spectre and you are not able to change the brand list of your current entrance. Uh-huh. Um, but you want your cookbook to validate that um, the person is using it right. Right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, you could definitely do that at compile time. 
Um, but you're, you're not guaranteed that nothing converged ahead of you. Yeah. So if you wanted that effect, you could do it in a library. But then the problem is, is that in that library, not all the attributes have loaded yet. So that's kind of gross. There might be a place for that somehow. You might be able to weasel it in. Mm -hmm. Before, where you check to make sure that, that an array exists, and then right. you check to make sure that its contents are, you know, they match some regex. Um, how do you make sure, or does it matter, that the check to make sure that it's an array runs before checking to make sure its elements match a regex? Um, I mean, I guess the real question is, does your example actually work? Yeah, it does work, man. Uh, I know, I know. Failures. What's that? Do you get two failures or one? Uh, one as, for the and one for the as implemented, the first thing that fails breaks the run. It throws an exception, but you you are welcome to implement a different thing. Like, like you could uh, you could have a roll up uh, where it's like keep running, keep running, keep running all the way to the end, and then in a in a end handler you could say, hey, here's a report on every violation I had. You could do that. Um, again, that's why I implemented it as a gem, because I'm not sure how people are going to want to use it. So it, that sounds like a good use case there. And what you mentioned there, um, I do know specifically in that case that uh, check, the, check the container, then check the contents of the container. I know that does work, because I've, I've used that pattern a lot, because people have put in a string where I wanted an array. Um, honestly, though, I'd have to go back and look at the source. It's guess, been guess, too long since I wrote I guess it. To, to, like, the, the, the real thing I'm wondering is yeah. if you're checking the contents of a container before yeah. checking if the container exists, what, but the container then doesn't exist, what, right. do you get a readable error message or do you, does, does it fall back to like one of the old uses? That would be a good test case. Okay. That, that would be a good test case. I'm, I'm not sure, honestly. Yeah, that would be, be a good test case because you're right. It would be gross if it said I, I can't do bracket bracket on a string. Well. Actually, it can do bracket bracket on a string, just not at all what you expect to have happen. So anyway, thank you. I'll, I'll try and get that in there. Or feel free to submit a patch. <laughs> so anyway, moving on. Uh, so validator, like I said, in production, using it's usable, it's awesome, it's fun, it's a good time. On to the more experimental, experimental gross stuff, tracer, in which entrails are examined. So. Validation ensures the final value is sane, and there's this thing called node attributes de debug value, which can dump each of the final values at each precedence level. But since we're all using default most of the time, that doesn't help you <laughs> much. <laughs> so, all right. So I wanted a way of finding out every time something changed, every time it was set, every time it was cleared, every time it was clobbered by a hash assignment. Anytime something like that happened. And I wanted to know a lot of information about when, where, and how that happened. All right, so here's an example. Um, we've got four roles that are in conflict, a, an environment, a cookbook, and CLI as well that are all getting involved. Uh, there's a role called uh, Famous Duck One uh, that is <laughs> declaring an attribute to be rabbit season and then at default precedence, and then a famous bunny rabbit comes back and says, no, it's duck season. These two go back and forth, and then we escalate to override, and then finally, bugs2 comes back and does something nasty on a run list to try to clobber it. All right? Now, this is the one I'm most like worried about, so. I need to go sacrifice a goat to the, you know, to the demonstration gods here. All right, so uh, this is about a 60 second convergence or so. Um, what's going on right now is it is running Vagrant. Uh, it's running it with uh, Chef debug logging turned on, and I'm running it through grep. Uh, so that's why we're not seeing any output yet. Um, in, inside this VM, what we have is a Chef server, and then it's running a Chef client against itself. I needed to have Chef server so I could have environments and some other stuff so that I'm not, I needed it to pretend to be something more full fledged than Chef Solo. All right, so we're starting to see some barf coming out. And uh, I'll wait till it finishes barfing before I go over and talk to it. Um, mm -hmm, finish barfing. No, not a little bit more barf. There we go. All righty, let's look at this thing. Um, so, la, 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 la. this is part of the presentation in which you watch me try to scroll. There we go. 
entrails. All right, so this right here, incidentally, these first few. All right, let's look at this. All right, path is hunting. Can you, can you see what I'm highlighting? Yeah. Anybody? I can call it out as I go. So it's saying the node path or the attribute path is slash hunting. The action is set. The precedence level being exercised is default. The value being set to is duck season. The mechanism is node. I went through and classified each one of the things that happens, and I called this node, because this is a node load from the server. There's also, deep farther down here, and a more verbose explanation giving details of the particular incident that occurred. In this case, it is setting attributes from a node record obtained from a server. <coughs> the node name was demo server, it is, and the server is localhost, because like I said, I'm running server internally. So, based on all that, you would be able to figure out what the hell just happened with that. Moving on, though, we see a lot of other action going on. Da, 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 da. Here's a roll load. Check this guy out. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, again, slash hunting. I've set this to only watch one path, slash hunting. Oh, really? All right. Oh, jeez. Okay, this will be quick. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. We see the roll name is Daffy1. All right, and we're applying attributes from loading a roll. One of the things you're going to see here is a lot of innards. Chef touches the node, uh, the node attributes object, or the CNA, a lot. It touches it a lot in a lot of different ways. So through this, you're going to see some of Chef's ex internals exposed, which I think is really educational. I learned a great deal about the Chef client during doing this. Um, anyway, the point is, is that through the course of all this, we see all these things changing back and forth, and the final value if you've seen the episode that I'm referring to, you know that it, in the value of the hunting season turns out to be Elmer season. And El the joke's on Elmer. Comedy. All right. How did you label? I mean, did you take different modules? Different, uh, Next slide. Okay. <laughs> All right. How to get it. It's hard to get. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, the form factor of this is not a module. It is not a cookbook. It is a patch against the chef client. <laughs> You can pull it from my GitHub. It's Clinton C. Wolf is my GitHub. Um, in other news, though, it is on the Chef ticket, uh, Chef2913. There's a pull request out against Core right now. It's being evaluated. Fingers crossed it'll end up in one of the next few versions, like 11.14 or 11.16 or something like that. I don't know. Um, it is a big merge, so we'll see. Um, in terms of the how to use it, there's a configuration uh, value called attribute tracing. Uh, you can set it to a specific path and get that path. I'm using the same path syntax as the other one. I don't have implemented globbing here, though, so it's just something dumb. Um, or you can set it to the string all. And my god, the things it will do if you say all. Um, expect a slowdown of 20 to 40 times of your convergence time. and It's going to hit so many things and bloat memory huge. Um, that's not, I don't expect you guys to do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> anyway. Most of it's coming from Ojai. Ojai, it sets so many attributes. Do you, uh, how would you trace two paths? Currently not supported. Uh, currently, you would set it to one path and then run it again with the other path. <laughs> Patch is welcome. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's that. Uh, by default, though, the value is none. And it does its best to do as little operation as possible when the value is none. So it doesn't do anything like that. Um, so yeah, tracing is a desperate measure. Do not use this in production. Um, feel free to use it against a production build, a stack of things that you're trying to diagnose, um, but don't actually leave it running. God, no. Um, tracing will show you all kinds of noisy spookiness, um, so it's not real obvious what's going on, but it will show you everything that's changing, so you will see lots of information. You'll have to interpret it a bit. Um, but the point is, it gives you that information, so if it turns out that one role was being changed by some other group, and your group is m maintaining some other role, and you've got some two groups in your organization going like this over something, you now know, and go talk to them. Don't override it more. Go talk to them. Go sit down and have a beverage with them or something like that. Be DevOpsy. Communicate. Uh, so the future of this, like I said, it's a pull request. Maybe it'll make it in, uh, though it is about 1,700 lines of changes. 900 of that's in testing. So um, that's a lot. We'll see what happens. Um, the innards are pretty grody. Uh, the mechanism by which it works is call stack introspection. Um, so in other words, whenever a set call happens, it, uh, uh, whenever a set call happens, it tries to examine the call stack and figure out what happened. There's also some brute 
brute force path search is going on and it's gross. So that's my end. Um, I think I got some time to take questions. We're going into transition time, right? All right, so anybody wants to stick around and talk to me, feel, please feel free. And I'm going to try and do some office hours afterwards in the what room? Uh, I think it's called Morena. The Morena room, whatever that room is. Um, and if you want to hear me rant about arrays and attributes, dude, I got a rant for you. Thank you. <laughs>